coming up on this episode of Inside the Epicenter. This to me, as much as anything else in scripture tells me, okay, judgment is coming to Israel's enemies and some of the neighbors are enemies. Israel doesn't understand who the Lord is and this should motivate us before these events happen to make sure that everybody in this part of the world knows Jesus. Okay, let's open the scriptures to Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, what Bible scholars often call the War of Gog and Magog. Ezekiel chapter 38, beginning in verse 1, and I'm reading from the New American Standard translation. And the word of the Lord came to me, this is Ezekiel writing, saying, Son of man, set your face toward Gog, of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I'm against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. Okay, so this Gog figure is some sort of leader. He comes from some sort of land, okay? And he's a political leader, a prince over some territory called Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal, okay? Don't know what Rosh is, don't know what Meshek is, don't know what Tubal is, okay. But the last part of that verse is, and prophesy against him, okay? That I can understand, right? So I go back to the category of things I can understand. Something goes badly for this Gog guy, right? God, with a D, is against Gog with a G. That I can understand, right? So. Just taking a deep breath, having a decaf, we're just slowing it down. What do I understand? God is against Gog. Okay, that's one, verse one, right? Now, and then he's not only supposed to hear this, Ezekiel is supposed to say this, right? Uh, What do we see in the airports all the time? See something, say something, right? That's what a watchman does. He hears, he sees, he speaks, or she. Verse four, God says to Gog, I will turn you about. I'm going to put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them splendidly attired, a great company with buckler and shield, and all of them wielding swords. Stop there. This guy is a prince. He's a political leader. He's from some place. God's against him, and wow, oh, now he's got an army. He's got an army, and God's going to pull him into some sort of war, some sort of battle. And he's going to bring all these military forces and set them into motion against some target. Okay? Right? We don't even know who these names are yet, but this is all easily discernible if we don't panic, if we slow ourselves down and look at the plot of the text. Now, verse 5, we begin to see some allies of this Gog figure come into play. Persia. Well, Persia is an easy one. It should be, because until 1935, Persia was the official legal name of the country we now call the Islamic Republic of Iran. So now suddenly we have a clue. Someday, Iran is going to play some factor as the first among equals of allies with this Gog figure in some sort of war that God is against but is setting into motion. And we can assume, at first, if God's against you and he's pulling you into war, that's going to lead to some sort of judgment. That's an assumption at this point. We'll see if it plays out in the text. For many of you, the next word is Ethiopia. Now, that's a challenge, again, in Bible prophecy, because when you see a word, you think, okay, well, it's Ethiopia. Well, it might be Ethiopia. In this case, I prefer translations that don't translate the ancient words into modern names. In this case, I think that would have been better, right? They didn't translate Magog into a country. They didn't even translate Persia into Iran. But they do take the word Cush and they translate it into Ethiopia. Now, the challenge with that is that Cush is an ancient territory south of Egypt which could certainly include what we currently call Ethiopia, but in the ancient times, Ethiopia was a much larger territory. Now, we would say this is Sudan, and of course there's two, a northern Sudan and then a southern Sudan, 
And it could also include Ethiopia, possibly Eritrea. But the point is, it's the upper Nile region, which in the uniquenesses of Egypt and that area means south of Egypt. So we would now call the primary territory here would be Sudan. I'm adding something that you can't know from this text, but it is a reason to be looking up the words in a Bible dictionary. Uh, Bluelletterbible.org is a great way to drill into a specific verse and then look at what are the Hebrew or in the New Testament Greek words or Aramaic and, uh, and other types of words uh, and to try to understand what's specifically being said. Okay, but that's, I'll give you that one for free. Uh, the next one is put. Where do we put put? Well, right now we put it in the category of countries we don't know. Okay? But all of these are allies of this Gog figure whom God is against. And they have shields and they have helmets. So they, uh, they're, in, they're part of the military coalition. Verse 6, Gomer with all its troops. Well, uh, I'll just tag, you know, you know, signal that this is not where Gomer Pyle is from. It, it, you, instinctually, you may have thought that. He was in the army, this has an army, but no, it's, in this case, that would be a, a, a wrong uh, interpretation. So we put Gomer in the category of, I don't know, but clearly this is another one of the allies, and they have troops as well. And then Beth Togarma, some girl named Beth, she's popped her way up, and no, no, this is, uh, this would mean House of Togarma. You, again, probably don't know it, put it in that category. But they come from the remote parts of the north. Okay, now we're getting some geography clues. We'll come back to that in a second. But they have all their troops too. Many peoples with them. What's happening is a military coalition is clearly uh, being formed. And God says to Gog, get ready, be prepared. That's the NIV translation. Here it says, be prepared, prepare yourself, you and all your companies. That doesn't mean Apple, Google, Intel. That means the military force. Get yourself ready for war. You will come into the land that is restored from the sword, all, you and all your companies uh, that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days, so we don't know how many days, you will be summoned. In the latter years, okay, bing, now that's an eschatological phrase. That suggests to us that this is a, an event that will happen in the end times. Because that latter years, the last days, the latter years, that, that's a phrase that's used repeatedly through the Old Testament, meaning it's not something that's going to happen in the life of the ancient Hebrew prophet. This is something that will happen in the last days of history. And in the latter years, you, this military force, this led by Gog, will come into the land that is restored from the sword. What land? Well, the land whose inhabitants have been gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel. Bing! A word we know. Woohoo! Right? We, now we know that this Gog figure is putting together an, an, a war machine, a multinational coalition to attack a country that's been reformed in the latter years, and its name is Israel. Okay, well now a picture is emerging out of the fog. For all the stuff that we didn't know, we suddenly know quite a bit, right? We know that, uh, that Israel is in the crosshairs of this Gog guy, okay? And what happens? Well, th this force will come against the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste, but its people were brought out from the nations, and they are living securely, all of them. This is interesting. If you'd read this any time over the last 2,000 years, you'd have to tell yourself, well, someday the Jews will be regathered into the land of Israel. And someday they will have a country called Israel again. And someday they will have taken all the... Uh, the, you know, the swamp land, the wasteland that had been a continual waste forever, it seemed, and they're going to make it work again. It will become a functional country, and a country of Jewish people called Israel that had been at war almost constantly will somehow feel like they're living securely someday in the future. So that means a whole set of things had to have happened before the Gog and Magog war could happen. Israel had to be reborn as a country. Now what's interesting is that Ezekiel 38 
you may have noticed, comes right after chapters 36 and 37. I know, that's a freebie also, in case you hadn't. But what happens in Ezekiel 36 and 37? Well, these are the most famous prophecies about Israel being regathered, Jews coming back to the land of Israel, Victor and uh, Esther and their families coming back to the land of Israel. My family coming back to the land of Israel and resettling in a land that once had been scattered, once had been a continual waste, once had been a, a fraught with warfare, now rebuilt and gathered and living securely. It never says peace in this chapter or the next. As you go through it, you would not find the word shalom or any of the other words that would suggest that Israel is actually at peace. So you want to be careful not to leap from living securely to peace. What does living securely mean? Well, I would argue that one could make the case to right now, Israelis feel like we're living securely. We don't have peace with all of our neighbors. Uh, we've got two peace treaties, though, the first in history. We have the most advanced and effective air force in the entire region. We have submarines uh, that uh, have missiles that it's been said, I've read somewhere that they might be armed with nuclear warheads that might be just under the water, just off the coast of Iran and some of our other allies, just waiting, just in case, hashtag just saying. <laughs> we never had that in 2,000 years. Now we do. We have missiles that can reach all of our enemies from our territory as well as from the submarines. This, is, this has never happened. We have a strategic alliance, a very close alliance with the world's only superpower, the United States. We have Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain and other Gulf states that don't have peace treaties with us showing more warmth and, and are gravitating towards us for the first time ever. We have a, a security wall that's prevented uh, suicide bombers by and large when we were being bombed in our cafes and schools and buses and, and uh, all kinds of, you know, city buses all the time just a, a number of years ago. Now we don't have that. I'm not saying it's peaceful entirely. But Israelis actually, if you look at the polls, say they feel more secure today than at any other time. Could that suggest we're getting close to Ezekiel 38 and 39 setting in motion? Possibly. Now, for the sake of time today, I am going to say that you can begin to do the research, what I call historical detective work, and begin to decipher what these words mean. I wrote a nonfiction book a number of years ago called Epicenter, where I walk through this prophecy in, in, in quite a bit of detail, and, and much of it is endnoted. You can go up and look, go and look up all my sources. But the short version for today is that Gog is not a name. It's not a formal, personal name. We're not looking for the emergence of Fred Gog, or <laughs> Bob Gog, or Ahmed Gog, or Dimitri Gog. It's not a name. It's a title like Pharaoh or Tsar. He's clearly a Bible bad guy. In verse 10, we get even more evidence. Thus says the Lord God, it will come about on that day. That phrase, by the way, on that day, is an eschatological phrase. It means something that's coming in the end times. That thoughts will come into your mind, to, speaking to Gog, and you will devise an evil plan, okay? He's a prince, he's a political leader of a territory, of a coalition, of military forces that are going to attack Israel in the last days. It's evil, God's against him. I think that part is clear. Verse 16, you, Gog, will come against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It shall come about in the last days that I will bring you against my land. So there are repeated references to this being a, an end time prophecy. Now, what happens? Once this fo coalition forms, verse 18 begins to explain what God says is going to happen. And I'm just going to forewarn you that you are not going to see any evidence in this text that Israel comes to its own defense. You are not going to see any evidence that the United States, this great ally of Israel, is going to come to Israel's defense. No evidence that the UN or the EU or NATO or any other country is going to come to Israel's defense when this Russian, Iranian, Turkish alliance comes against Israel in the last days. What is going to happen? Verse 18. 
It will come about on that day when Gog comes against the land of Israel, declares the Lord God, that my fury will mount up in my anger. In my zeal and in my blazing wrath, I declare that on that day there will surely be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. The fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, and all the creeping things that creep on the earth, and all the men, all the men, that was, I would circle the word all, the men who are on the face of the earth will shake at my presence. The mountains will also be thrown down. The steep pathways will collapse. Every wall will fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against him, him who, Gog, on all my mountains, declares the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother. With pestilence or disease and with blood, I will enter into judgment. Okay, there's the word that finally emerges. We're not guessing this is judgment. This is judgment. That's what God says. God says, I will enter into judgment with him, with Gog, and on the many peoples who are with him, who allied themselves with Gog, this Russian dictator, a torrential rain with hailstones, fire, and brimstone. I will magnify myself, sanctify myself, and make myself known in the sight of many nations, and they will know that I am the Lord. Hi, this is Joel Rosenberg. If you've enjoyed this podcast, let us know. Go to joshuafund.com and use the Contact Us form to provide feedback. Likewise, if you'd like this podcast to continue, you can donate through our giving page, and you can find that link in the upper right-hand corner at joshuafund.com. This is what happens in drama, right? Whether it's a novel, but better, I would say, in a movie. The good guy doesn't make it. The hero doesn't make it to the damsel in distress until the last possible moment, right? You say, well, how come Israel's not defending herself? Because God doesn't want Israel to take its own glory. Well, how come the United States isn't coming? Well, we don't know that. Does the United States even exist at this moment? Are they neutralized? Are they paralyzed politically? We don't know. It doesn't talk about it. Why isn't anybody else coming? I don't know. It doesn't talk about it. But it just, we're, it's clear that nobody comes to Israel's defense, even though the noose is tightening around Israel's neck at this moment in the future, and God comes. He supernaturally comes, and he wants everybody to know, to, to know that he is God, and he wants everybody to see his glory. Very specifically, verse 21 of the next chapter, and God says, I will set my glory among the nations and all. I would circle all. All the nations will see, not hear about, not read in the paper. They will see my judgment, there's that word again, which I have executed and my hand which I have laid on them. And the house of Israel will know that I am the Lord their God from that day onward. And the nations will know that the house of Israel went into exile for their iniquity because they had acted treacherously against me. And I hid my face from them, so I gave them into the hand of their adversary, and all of them fell by the sword. According to the uncleanness and according to their transgression, I dealt with them. I hid my face from them. But then, now, he's saying, but now I'm back. Just when you thought I wasn't going to get there in time, I'm coming. I'm coming to judge Israel's enemies, and I'm coming to rescue Israel. Now, this is what happens in the movies. Think about it in the old-fashioned movies, right? The silent movies, the black and white movies, when, when the, the damsel in distress has got the, you know, she's, she's tied up, she's got the gag in her mouth, and she's like, <laughs> and, they, and, now, and the bad guy's with the black you know, hat and the black cape, and he's dastardly, and he ties her to the derailleur tracks. <laughs> now, what happens? Where's the hero? They, we cut to the hero. The hero is being attacked by bad guys, and he's on a horse. <laughs> And then cut back to <laughs> bad guy <laughs> are shooting at our hero. The, the hero is in the mountains and, and everybody's attacking. He has to turn around and go the other way. Back to 
Now what happens? Oh, now we cut to the train. Mm, mm. And even though you can't hear the train because you're hearing the, the piano music, but you can see the steam come out as it's coming around the bend. And the, she's like, mm, mm, oh, mm, mm, mm. and he's like, right? And the bad guys are coming and it's getting closer and closer. And that train is coming. We cut to the train. We cut to the damsel. We cut to the hero. We cut to the bad guys. Back to the train. Back to the damsel. Back to the hero. Back to the train. Back to the... Right at the last minute, he jumps off the horse. He rolls over the tracks. The damsel is swept off and the train goes by. And you're like, ah! Because you've never seen a movie in 1920 and you think she's going to be cut in half in front of you. That's the hero arriving at the last possible moment. That's how drama is done. There's no point in having the hero get there early. Why would you go? <laughs> Why would you stay? Why would you buy popcorn? You only are going to watch this thing and be riveted on it if the hero arrives late. Welcome to the hero. God is our hero. God loves the nation of Israel, but Israel is a, we, we have been a damsel who've, uh, you know, we've uh, dallied with every other potential suitor on the planet. We have not been faithful to our hero. But that's what makes his heroism even more powerful, even sweeter. His love for her is sweeter, deeper, richer, because she has not been faithful. But rather than wish harm on her, the hero is coming. And the hero's going to get there just in time. And all the world is going to be watching. We live in the moment of history, the first moment in history, where the world can watch this happen because of the miracle of global satellite television technology, because of the internet. We, we could watch this if it happened next week, next month, next year. We could watch this. The whole world would watch this. And wouldn't they? No matter what else has happened in the world, if, if, if Russia, Iran, Turkey, and the rest of the world is about to consume Israel, and the United States doesn't come, we'll be curious what's going to happen. And why? Why is the hero come late? Because he wants everybody to be riveted. He is an author, right? The author and perfecter of our faith. He is the number one New York Times bestseller of the world of all time. It's not me, it's him. Right? He's the author. He, he's, he's quite a dramatist. And what, what's the ultimate goal? The ultimate goal is to show his glory, that's what he says, and to reveal himself both to the nations and to Israel herself. Look at um, the end of chapter 39, starting in verse 28. Chapter 39, verse 28. Then they will know, the world will know, that I am the Lord their God. And specifically Israel will know this. Because I made them go into exile among the nations and then gathered them again into their own land. Right? This can only happen after Israel's been reborn as a country. And Israel hadn't been reborn as a country for 1900 years, and now it has been. And so, at least for that portion, we can say, check, things are in motion. They, God brings us back into our own land, and he says, and I will leave none of them there any longer. And then verse 29, I love, love verse 29. I hope you do too. God says very clearly, I will not hide my face from them any longer. It's not me, it's him, right? He's the author. He, he's, he's quite a dramatist. And what's the ultimate goal? The ultimate goal is to show his glory, that's what he says, and to reveal himself both to the nations and to Israel herself. Look at um, the end of chapter 39, starting in verse 28. Chapter 39, verse 28. Then they will know, the world will know, that I am the Lord their God. And specifically Israel will know this. Because I made them go into exile among the nations and then gathered them again into their own land. Right? This can only happen after Israel's been reborn as a country. And Israel hadn't been reborn as a country for 1900 years, and now it has been. And so, at least for that portion, we can say, check, things are in motion. They, God brings us back into our own land, and he says, and I will leave none of them there any longer. And then verse 29, I love, love verse 29. I hope you do too. God says very clearly, I will not hide my face from them any longer. 
For I will have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, declares the Lord God. Now, in the old days, the Old Testament period, knowing that the Holy Spirit was going to be poured out and God was going to rescue Israel, that's a good thing. We, we would say, Dianu, uh, this alone would be enough. But in the New Testament, we understand the, what the role of the Holy Spirit is. Right? The role of the Holy Spirit is to reveal the identity of the Messiah, the identity of Yeshua, Jesus. So as he pours out his Holy Spirit, he's going to physically save and rescue the, the nation of Israel when no one else could or would, her own army included. And then he's going to start pouring out his Spirit. This is, and he's not going to hide his face anymore. He's going to reveal himself and the identity of his Son. And this means that more Jews will be coming to faith in Jesus as Messiah, Lord, and King at this moment and in the aftermath of this moment than at any other time in human history. I believe because the world will see it also, and the Spirit will be being poured out, that many, I think many Muslims, will come to the conclusion that the, the God that they thought was going to help wipe out Israel must not be the right God. That the God of Israel is the one true God, and that Jesus is in fact who he claims to be, the way, the truth, and the life, and that there is no other way to get to know God personally and be adopted into his family, to have your sins forgiven and go to heaven except through faith in Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. That's what this prophecy is about. Why would you skip it? You don't understand the first few words? Okay. They're, 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 they're figureoutable. I know that's not a word. I'm just making things up, but I, that's what I do. I make things up. But you can see, once you get a sense of that, you think, wow, well, th 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 this is important. Yes, yes, this is important. This is why we don't want to skip things like this. For me, this so compels me that this, to me, as much as anything else in Scripture, tells me, okay, judgment is coming to Israel's enemies, and some of the neighbors are enemies. Israel doesn't understand who the Lord is, and this should motivate us before these events happen to make sure that everybody in this part of the world knows Jesus. That they've at least heard the gospel and made their decision to receive him or to reject him. To me, this is one of the great motivators, for me personally, for why we have the Joshua Fund. Because we are watchmen. And we, we, okay, we're not watchmen in the Old Testament sense, but that's a principle that carries over. Now we know what's coming because of the prophets like Ezekiel. And because we know this and we see many trend lines suggesting how close we're getting, okay, it could be a hundred years away. God could kick the prophetic can up the road. It could be decades and decades away, maybe, but maybe not. <laughs> you know, it's pretty extraordinary the moment we're in. And I don't want to have blood on my hands, even of Israel's enemies, Iran, Syria, Lebanon, all of Israel, uh, Iran's allies, Russia's allies. No, no, no. They all need the gospel. Thanks for listening to Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg. To learn more about how God is moving in the Epicenter through the Joshua Fund, head over to joshuafund.com and sign up for our e-newsletter. Through those emails, you'll hear encouraging stories of life change that will surely bless you as well. Thank you for listening to Inside the Epicenter.